the Lord is good. And all the time, God is good. Now today, I'll be taking us to the God of harvest. It's called the word for now. The word for now, the on-time word that will get the job done on time. The on-time word. And this morning, I'll be taking us to the God of harvest. Oh, hallelujah. And I'll be looking at the three dimensions of revelation of God's word. Oh, three dimensions of revelation of God's word. I want you to take your seat. I want you to give me your heart and listen attentively as the Lord will be speaking to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this morning. Thank you for a time of encounter. Thank you for a time of interaction. And the time of experiencing the dimensions of the Spirit. Thank you for the revealed world. Lord, I pray, take us from where we are to where we ought to be in you. I pray, O oh Lord my God, for everyone under the sound of my voice, that none will be distracted. Lord, I take authority over every form of distraction. Nothing will distract you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And dear Lord Jesus, I pray, O oh Lord, speak through me. And speak to your people. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you praise and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. It. Amen. I want to warn you against distraction. Many times when a word is coming with the capacity to change and totally transform your life, be careful that you are not distracted at that point in time because something will happen. Because Satan does not want you to receive the word. It will cause something to happen that will take your eyes away, that will take your focus away from the word. And at that instant, you might just miss a word you've been waiting for, you've been looking towards, you've been praying for. You might just miss the word. But I pray for you this morning that you not miss the word that will change your life forever. Because God is bringing that word to you again this morning in the name of Jesus. Three dimensions of revelation of God's word. I'm laying the foundation. God builds from foundation. Three dimensions of revelation of God's word. Number one, inspiration. One, inspiration. What is inspiration? Settle this in your heart. That the word of scriptures, the words you hear today, the words given in God's word to us, Settle it in your heart that these are not cunningly devised fables. Settle it in your heart. They are not just, not, they are not just uh, what the Bible calls, uh, maybe just fables. They are not just words, coined, manufactured by someone. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, not some of the scripture, all scripture. Meaning that all scripture, not just the ones we like, not just the ones we prefer, not just the ones that we tend, that, that tends to, yes, I, I like this word. If you are just reading the words you like, you are reading your greed into his creed. Learn to take the scripture. That means that the words of God, all scripture, is what is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for what? It's profitable for doctrine. That means that when you listen to that word, when you are inspired by, by, by that word, when you settle that word in your heart, the word has the capacity, the potential to bring profit into your life. When I say profit, I'm not talking about trading. I'm talking about the, God, the word prospering in your life. Profitable for what? For doctrine. Profitable for what? For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That means when you receive the word, the word is profitable for doctrine. The word doctrine means teaching. And it's for what? For reproof and for correction. That word has the capacity of bringing ethical correction into your heart, into your life, and for instruction in righteousness. Settle it. That the word you are hearing is what? Is what? Is profitable for doctrine. Settle it in your heart that this is God's word for your life. 
first dimension inspiration if you don't settle this in your heart you're not likely going to meet to the next dimension you're not likely going to experience the next dimension it's profitable for inspiration profitable for doctrine for the proof of correction for instruction in righteousness number two or the second dimension is called illumination illumination sometimes god's word will come as mysteries but mysteries remain mysteries until they are uncovered illumination so when you start to take the word of god and personalize the word in your life when you start to apply it to your life what you start to do is to bring illumination to your heart illumination number one inspiration number two illumination when you start to take the word the word you have not applied to your life you are not likely going to experience when you take the word when the word comes and you say yes lord i receive the word that is why we should not be passive when the word of god is being released we're not supposed to be passive observers we're supposed to be active participants so that when the word of god is coming when the word of god is hitting you say lord i received the word i want to thank you i declare this word over my life this is what the word of god is saying concerning me the word of god has come the i will world emerge infinitely better what god says to what god is saying to all the word has been given to every one of us but if you don't receive it if you don't personalize it if you don't lay hold on it you are not likely or you are unlikely to experience it illumination psalm 119 verse number 105 what does it say psalm 119 verse 105 says and the war is war the word is lamp to my feet lamp look at what the psalmist look at the writings of the psalmist there the word is a lamp to my feet he personalized it he didn't say the word is lamp to our feet the word is lamp to my feet and a light to my path meaning that when the word of god becomes lamp to my feet when is a word that will be received then that word becomes what gives light brings direction to us when the word of god is received praise the name of the lord when the word of god is received The word brings what? Direction to our hearts. Direction to our lives. The word is lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. The word is lamp unto our feet or lamp unto my feet and light to my path. The word you have now received on your inside is unlikely to give direction to you on the outside the lamp to my feet part of your body then it becomes light to the path that you want to travel upon lamp onto my feet and light to my path illumination then verse number 130 what does it say 130 says the entrance of your word gives what light he gives understanding to the simple. The entrance to your word gives what? Light and understanding to the simple. The entrance, of, when you enter into the word, it gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. What is the word simple? The word simple there means that the word to the one whose heart is open. To the one whose heart is not made up. To the one whose heart is ready to receive what God is saying. Be open to the word of God. Don't just say yes. This is what I've learned. This is what I know. The moment you find something in the world that is contrary to what you have learned, make the necessary adjustments. Amen. Because the word of God is the final authority. Not what somebody said. Not what somebody, the way somebody has said it. But the moment you find it in God's word, it brings what? Light. And it brings what? Understanding toward the simple. It's called what? Illumination. The moment you receive inspiration, 
The moment the word of God is illuminating your heart, then what you experience is a third dimension called manifestation. Manifestation. Sometimes we all want manifestation. We are asking for, oh, let the word manifest. But the word is not, is a word, you have not received it. The word has not become more flesh to you. The word is not shining any light onto your path. And so we say, yes, I want it to. No, it, it, it doesn't just manifest like that. You receive it. You, it becomes yours. It becomes flesh to you. It, it becomes real to you on your inside. Then nothing on earth can stop it from manifesting on the outside. Manifestation is the third dimension. John 14, verse number 21. John 14, verse number 21. Let's go there. And Jesus said to John chapter number 14, verse number 21. And he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who has what? He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by what? My Father. And I will love him. And I will manifest myself to him. I want us to listen to that word very carefully. He who has my commandment and what? Keeps them. How many times have you said to the Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love your name, Lord Jesus. When we sing that song, or when we say to him from time to time, Jesus, I love you, you know what he does? He checks your heart to see how are you applying his word in your life. Because it is he who has his commandment and is keeping them. The what? To him is that person who loves him. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. He said, I will love him and I will make myself real to him. I will make my word his experience. I will make what I promised an experience of this man. That means that whatsoever I've said in my word, because this man has my commandments, and this man is keeping my commandments. Number one, inspiration. Number two, illumination. Number three, manifestation. He said, because this man has been inspired by my word, this man is keeping my word, or this woman is keeping my word, is, you know, keeping personalizing it, then he will bore, he or she will experience the manifestation of the word. Before I'll go further, remember, we're looking at the God of harvest. When I'm laying some foundations here, before we go into all of that, before I go into that, I want to take us again, the three dimensions of the world and also the three dimensions of the kingdom of God. The three dimensions of the kingdom of God. Mark 4 from verse number 30. He reads and I quote, Then he said, Mark 4, verse number 30. What does this? 430, then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parables shall we picture it? What are parables? Parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. So what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Here directly from the mouth of the master. Or what, with what shall we picture it? Verse number 31. And that says, it is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. Ooh. But when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the beds of the air may nest under its shade. Verse number 33. 33. Praise the name of the Lord. I'll read it again. You know, and he said, okay, 33. And he said, to what shall we lack in the kingdom of God from verse number 30? Or with what parable shall we picture it? 31. It is like a mustard seed. When it is sowed on the ground, 
it is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. 32. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the best of the air may nest under its shade. 33. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to walk to hear it with many sort of parables and without a parable he did not speak to them and when they were alone he explained all things to his disciples three dimensions of the kingdom of God number one the kingdom is likened to a seed likened to a seed mustard seed it's called the mustard seed principle the mustard seed principle. The kingdom will always start small. It will always start small. Did you notice that you are not born an adult? You are born as babies. God will always start small. I doubt it. That is of God. When something that God is starting in you, with you, or for you, that the thing is starting so big already. God does not walk like that. God will always start what? Small. If he's asking you to start a business, it will start with you in a small way. If it's a church, it will always start what? In a small way. I remember when we started. It was so small. So small. Just a few of us. We started. But because of my understanding of the kingdom of God, I wasn't what? Distracted or what? This stop, you know, you know that God will always start small. Amen. It is called the mustard seed. That is why I want to say to you that don't despise the days of small beginnings. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. Don't despise it. Zechariah chapter 4 verse number 10. Don't despise it when you're starting small. We all want things to start huge and start big. And then, oh yeah, so that many times so that you can boast and say, come and see what we accomplish in a very little time. You know, yes, you can start big, but when you have not gone through the process, I'm telling you, when you have not learned, when you have not learned to keep what God is giving to you, what you have not learned to hold on to, you are likely going to lose. So God will always start small with us. It is like a mustard seed. It will start small. Whatever God is asking you to do, it will start small. He likened it to a seed. He said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is what? Like a what? We, wash our love. we picture it is like a mustard seed. The mustard seed is the smallest form of seed or type of seed I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't know whether you've seen the mustard seed. I have. It was brought to me by one of us many years ago. And I held it in my hands while I was preaching. And I was using it to explain things to people. Then the breath, my breath blew it from my palm. And it landed on the floor, and I could not retrieve it. It was so small that it disappeared with this most minute grain. And I'm not talking about sand here. Imagine, uh, you know, a floor, normal floor, not, not sand, but normal floor. It disappeared into it. It was so small. God says that the kingdom is like a mustard seed. Oh, hallelujah. Meaning that there's no one that God cannot start with. Because it is it, it's small. God will start small with you. So that everyone will have capacity to contain what God wants to do. Uh, because if God says, I'm going to start in a particular way, maybe majority will have been eliminated. But he wants to start small with everyone. In the most minute way. In the smallest way. So that you can carry and grow what God wants to do. Don't forget. That's why don't despise days of small things. Don't despise days when things seem, 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 seems to be so small. Or, what, or the way we normally say when nothing seems to be happening. Don't despise it. Don't look at the business and say, look, uh, in the last one month, not, nothing really. Is your time to incubate it? Is your time to pray over it? Is your time to trust God for it? Amen. When God is also teaching you the word of God, they say, oh, I've attended the Bible study. I've been in church in the house. Look, I don't know why. I can't remember the word. I can't seem to. Oh, pastor will just quote it and quote it. But I can't remember anything. Is a time. Don't forget. 
said the pastor has been doing it for many years, probably before you came into the kingdom or the church. So you need to also learn, take your time, meditate on it, spend time with it so that the work can become flesh in you. But God will always start with you in a small way. Number two, he likened the kingdom. He now said this, he does not multiply until it is sown. He does not multiply until it is sown. It's like a mustard seed when it is sown. When simply means that there's a time frame. That means if it's not sown, nothing happens. If it's not sown, nothing happens. It's like a mustard seed, but when it is sown, until the kingdom is sown, amen. It doesn't have the capacity to multiply, but the moment you sow it, it starts to develop capacity to what? To increase and multiply until it becomes what? A harvest. The God of harvest. I'm teaching us how to do we encounter the God of harvest? If we don't start to sow this word, if we don't start to take this word and sow it into your heart, it does not multiply. In fact, the Bible says the birds of the air will come and steal it and then take them away, take the word away. But when you start to word, when you take the word and start to sow the word into your heart, that is when the process of multiplication begins. Multiplication begins. Praise God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> it will start to multiply. It will start to increase. Meaning that multiplication, increase, and harvest, they are essential ingredients of the kingdom. Anywhere where the kingdom of God is operating, expect increase, expect multiplication, and eventually what? Harvest. So we're not just talking about sins, and sometimes when you talk about harvest, or you're talking about God of harvest, the natural mind sometimes is thinking about, okay, maybe we're talking about money. The kingdom is far, far bigger than that. Far, far, far bigger than that. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. And number three is this, that when it will start to grow, when it starts to grow, when it starts to multiply, it has the capacity to produce such a huge harvest greater than any other thing around it when it's sold it becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out light branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade that is when you start to sow it gradually step by step it will continue to grow and expand and increase and multiply until it will start to shoot out large branches so that the beds of the air will come and what and take refuge in it it's called the city of refuge take refuge in it and sometimes but well, i need to clarify this that a lot of times when we hear this, when we talk about this, it's, people say that, yes, he's talking about the church growing big and big and big and big and eventually so big that the whole world will come and find refuge in it. Well, well that, is, that is a dimension of it. Why that is not wrong, but I need to emphasize the primary interpretation of this. What is the top primary interpretation of these? <sighs> what is the primary interpretation of these? Jesus says something in Luke chapter number 17 from verse number what? 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God will come, Luke 7, 20, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God will come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here, see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is where? Within you. So Jesus here is primarily not talking about something happening outside of you. He's talking about something happening within you 
as you take and start to sow the revealed word of God into your heart, what will start to happen is it will start to increase and grow and multiply and will start to shoot out branches that eventually, you know what will start to happen? You start to become a blessing to others. And that is why I need to say to us that when we're talking about harvest, listen to me very, very clearly. I'm not just talking about you coming into, oh yes, you know, we now have a huge harvest. We now have greater, lots of goods. We now have lots of these. We now have lots of that. That is not the kingdom. Yes, you may have lots of good. According to God, it has not become a harvest yet until what you have is starting to what? Be a blessing to others. If it's not shooting out like branches, the others can now come and find succor and find comfort and find encouragement in it. You have not reached harvest yet. You may have an abundance of products, maybe abundance of resources. It is still not harvest yet. But when it becomes harvest is when others can find succor. Others can find comfort. Others can find things from it. You know what will start to happen? Oh, then God would not start to call that harvest has come. Amen. Three dimensions of revelation of the word of God. Three dimensions of the kingdom. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And that will now take me to what I want to remember. I'm laying foundation on the God of harvest. That will take me now to what is called testing. Testing. Because the moment you have the word being revealed, the moment you have the word of God being sold in your heart, and the kingdom is starting to expand, then be ready for what? Testing. Because without testing, there won't be what? Testimony. Testing. The Bible says, after a while, God tested what? Abraham. Testing will come. Be ready for your own tests. Amen. Be ready for your own test. Why does God allow a period of testing? Is to prune us. To prune us. To shape us. To align us. So that we can work. Be ready to be everything that he has called us to be. So now, verse number 35. Verse number 35. On the same day. Not a different day. The same day that he spoke to them of the, about the parable of the sower. The same day he spoke to them about the parable of the mustard seed. The same day he spoke to them about the parable of the kingdom, different parables of the kingdom. On the same day when evening had come. On the same day, not even a different day. Not a different day. On the same day. Same day when evening had come. I was meditating on this. And God said to me, you know that this evening is also representing a period in our lives. Some of us are in the morning of our lives. Little children. Babies. Teenagers are in the morning of their lives. Sometimes when people... And especially with teenagers, they think, yes, they have now grown. They have now matured. We can do this, we can do that. But by the time they said they can vote, or especially when they turn 18, even some before turning 18, they believe that, yes, now I have the liberty, I have the freedom to do this or to do that. You are just in the morning of your life. Thank God that the morning can reveal the day. But it's still the morning of your life. Some of us are in the morning of our lives. And then some of us are in the afternoon of our lives. That is those of us who are, you are out of school. You know, in the morning of your life, that period is dominated by schooling. It's about your education. So that you can lay proper foundation for your future. It's about your education. So the emphasis there is your education. You go to school. You learn. You, you, you learn not just by learning to study. You are learning to discipline yourself. You are learning to work, become more responsible. 
Because freedom without responsibility will produce disaster. Because by the time you get to your adult life, when you cannot do things for yourself, if you have not learned the proper discipline as foundation, you will destroy that life. So education, oh, you wake up in the morning for so many years, you go to school, you are in class at a particular period. You must be in class. If you're in primary school, they, they, you must be. When they say, it's time for this, you show up there. It's time for that, you are there. You don't have the liberty to decide whether you'll attend that class or not. You have to be there. They enforce it on you. If you are in high school, which is part of the morning of your life, similar thing. The periods are there. And the moment you start to get to the higher classes in high school, get to the university, which is you are entering into the afternoon of your life, you now have more, more freedom. You can decide that maybe I will do it this way, I will not do it that way. But when you have learned the proper discipline in the morning of your life, you know what to do, the appropriate things, and when not to do, do what? The thing you are not supposed to do. When you are doing the right things at the wrong time, or you are doing the wrong things at the right time, it's going to cause what? Lots of trouble and heartache. So in the morning is to train you to prepare for the afternoon. In the afternoon is determined by what? You, 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 know, you still have education. You are still going to school. Maybe you are doing your degree or you are doing your master's or you are doing your higher degrees. And also we are working. So the afternoon is combined with working and studying. You are doing the two together. Doing the two together. At that time, you're thinking of getting married. You're thinking of not finding a spouse. Now I think I want to settle down. Those are still functions of the afternoon. Young families. Then you, you get to evening. In the evening, most people in the evening, it's a time of consolidation of the things you've been doing in the morning and in the afternoon. And it's a time that when people are already in their 50s or in their 60s, it's called the evening of their lives. And now, you know, the final one is called what? The night time. The night time is when everything is winding up. The, some of us, you are listening to me. Many of us are in the morning of our lives. Many of us are in the afternoon of our lives. Many of us are in the evening of our lives. Very few of us are in what is called the night fall. The night is when the curtain is about to drop. When you're about to say bye-bye to what? To planet Earth. You can't run as you used to. You now take steps gently. What? You take your step gradually. Before you run upstairs. Brrr, you are there. Brrr, you are there. But now, you, you, you still desire to do it, but the bones and the body say, no, you can't run like that again. You are not taking one step after the other. It's called the night time of your life. And it's a time, not even just, not of consolidation now, it's a time that you ensure that your legacy is properly set. In fact, all the, or even from, from evening, you must start to prepare your legacy. And then night time, your legacy must be said. So that whatever God has done with you, done for you, done through you, can be what? Imparted to the next generation and you send them to a future that you will not likely see. It's quite interesting that this time, Jesus said when, the Bible said when evening had come. When evening had come. Why didn't he say when morning had come? Or when the afternoon had come? Because he spoke to them all day. Why didn't this happen in the afternoon or even in the morning? It's just to let us know that it's not over until it is over. Because sometimes when people be turned 50, they say, you know, we're going old now. You know, we're getting old now. You know, it's not a time to hear you're getting old. We're not getting old. You're just in the evening of your life. It's a time to war, to the fire. It's a time to war, to consolidate. During the week, I was listening to a very elderly pastor who was retiring at the age of 88 and said that he was stepping out as the senior pastor of the church or stepping down as a senior pastor of the church, but was retiring in the ministry that God has called him to. At 88, I looked at him. 
it was still quite strong. I said, wow. I said, indeed, you don't retire. You continue to refire. Amen. Somebody say, oh, I'm not. No, 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 no. You may retire from government work. You may retire. They may even retire you from government work. But in the kingdom, God does not retire anybody. Amen. You continue to refire until finally you say bye-bye to planet Earth. When evening hard work had come. When evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. The time of testing had come for the word you've been hearing. <laughs> oh, because before the kingdom will start to work, really, really, be, the harvest will come, be ready for the testing. The testing is to prepare you for the huge harvest. Oh, yes, you may have the abundance. Oh, look at this. But when you go through the test, how do you give what you, have, with what you do? You can't give what you don't have. When you have not gone through anything, how do you encourage others who are going through? Grace is not just imparted on the bed. Grace is imparted that as you go through and you learn some things, you what grace is imparted unto you so that you can now what, be able to take others through their own journeys too. When the evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Can we call this period even the evening of this year? Can we call it the evening of this year? The January, the February, the March. Wow. Things. You can call those ones maybe the mornings. Of February, January, February, March, April. Then maybe the May, the, the May, June, July, maybe those ones are afternoon. The moment you now start to hit the August and the September, you are rounding up the year. But look at Jesus telling them at the evening when they were supposed to say, okay, maybe we need to go and rest now. He said, no, it's time to cross over to the other side. That's why I kept telling you that it is not over for us in this year. That's why I kept, I've been telling you that this year is not gone, is not finished yet. Can you imagine at this period, Jesus said to them, to what? Go and sleep? No. Go and rest? No. He said, it's time to begin the journey, to cross over to the other side. The other side of experiencing the manifestation of the power, of the grace, of the glory of God in a dimension they have not known before. Let us cross over to the other side. A time whereby what they do, what they receive will be tested so that it can be grounded in them. Do you know? Oh, somebody, and uh, let's, let's continue. Verse number 35, 36. Now when they had left the multitude behind, oh, oh, they took him along. You know, in taking that journey, they had to leave some behind. Left the multitude, not the disciples, not the apostles, but the multitude. Do you know that every promotion in God will always require you to leave something behind? Every time God is calling you up, any time God will say, come up hither, it may require leaving something behind. Maybe something you love to do. When God is calling you to the place of prayers, it may require cutting down on more television time. When God is calling you to a time to himself, it may require you do, doing what? Dropping the time with the parties. You've been crying, say, Lord, I want to do you the more. I want to be closer to you. I want you to use me. And you say, okay, give me your Saturday. And Saturday is the normal time you, you get dressed for the next party. It will always require, I remember a man called Catherine Coleman that was so mightily used of God. And people will ask her, can you share with us the secret? What did you do? How, how come God has been able to use you like this? What did you do? He said, you don't know the process of death I've gone through unless the corn of wheat falls to the ground. It's called humility and dies. It abides alone. But when it dies, it brings forward, it's called huge harvest. Are you ready for the dimension of harvest that God will show us? I'm laying the foundation for it. That there will be a time of testing. It's at this time that the boys are separated from the men. 
It's at this time that those who truly want to go further are separated from those who are just talking about it. Because God will not cast his peers before what? Before swine. And he said, let us go. They left the multitude behind. And they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also what? With him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat. So that it was already filling. Oh, a great windstorm. When did the windstorm happen? When they were on the journey to the other side. Meaning if they have not embarked on the journey, they would never have experienced the storm. Sometimes the storms you are going through is because you are on your journey to the other side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at the period that we've experienced in the past few months. Look at how uncomfortable it's been. Look at how almost unprecedented it's been. But I'm telling you, if God did not intend it, he would never have allowed it. Tell me there are things we need to learn from it so that we can come out better, come out much, much better, infinitely better than when the entire thing started. Can I tell you that whenever God is asking to do something uncomfortable, it's because he's about to do something remarkable. Yeah. That he's about to do something remarkable. When he told them to leave the comfort of, the, uh, uh, of where they were and said, no, move to the other side. They didn't know they were about to experience the greatest storm and accompany the greatest storm will be the greatest miracle of their lives up to that point in time. Oh, I remember the words of Smith Wigglesworth. He said, the harder the ground, the greater, oh, the opportunity you are giving to God to display his glory. And a great windstorm, it didn't just say storm, it's a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Verse number 38, but when but he was in the stand, asleep on a pillow, oh, how can he be sleeping in the midst of a great storm? It's called, you are God alone. From, you are on your throne. God alone. Oh, I'm telling you, because he's the Lord of the storm. And thank God, the Lord of the storm was in the boat of their lives. But it was in the stand asleep on the pillow. And they are walking and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Did you notice that the storms didn't wake him up? But their cries woke him up. Sometimes the storms might not wake, but when you will hear your cry, it will hear the cry of your prayers. It will hear the cry of your supplication. It will hear the cry of your intercession. It will say, Yo, that's one of mine. That's one of mine. He was in the sun asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Notice that word. They say we, meaning all of us are perishing. <laughs> Obviously, they still did not know the person in the boat with them. Say that we are. How many times is it that we don't even know what well, we forget the one that is in the boat of our lives? The Bible calls him the greater one. The greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And they are walking and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse number 39. Then he arose and rebuked what? He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. He didn't rebuke the storm. He rebuked the wind that was causing the storm. He rebuked the wind that was producing the storm. He went to the foundation of the problem and rebuked it. And what happened? He said, peace be still. Why? Because the prince of peace is the one speaking. And he spoke peace to it. He said, peace be still. And the wind ceased. And it's also to teach us that a lot of times, the problem we see in the natural are put Produced by factors beyond the natural. Produced by factors beyond the natural. Many times we respond or we react to the natural rather than responding to God to help us handle whatever we're experiencing. We react. You can't solve spiritual problems with physical means. We, you can't solve it. Jesus went and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, 
peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great war calm. Hallelujah. There was a great calm. And now look at it. Verse number 40. He now said to them, Why? Do you know he didn't rebuke them for what? For being what? He didn't rebuke them. He said, Why? Oh, this storm is this storm is indeed so so powerful. Oh wow. Look at it. The storm was he didn't rebuke he didn't, he didn't mention that at all. He didn't talk about the storm. Why? Because storms of life will come. You can't do anything about storm. There will be, you know, you can't do anything about people coming to knock your door. You can't stop people from calling you. Marketers will call your phone sometimes. You can't go and call, uh, call Tesla. I wanted to say night. You can't go and call Tesla uh, uh, and then call and tell them, oh, block the block my phone from marketers calling me. You can't do that. You can't stop Optus from doing that. But you know what? You can stop them from what? Getting your time. You can't stop them from coming to knock on your door. Sometimes some people have knocked on, on our door. Unwanted guests. Unwanted visitors. And do you know what? The moment, oh, I'm sorry. Or oh, will not even allow that. You can't stop people from coming to knock on your door. But you have what? The right to determine who will enter into your what? Into your home. Can you stop the belt from flying over your head? Is it possible? Because the Lord in Jesus' name, I rebuke every belt from flying over my head right now. No bed. You can't stop that. But what you can do, you can stop one from laying heads on your head. Or laying eggs. Or planting a nest. In your air. Can you do that? Of course you can do that. You can shake it away and say you can't you can you can't stay here. So storms will come. But do you know he now said to them, his object, what he addressed was their response to the storm, not the storm, not the storm itself. So why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? And I'm saying this to us, why are we so fearful of COVID? Why has the church been so fearful of COVID? Why have we been so afraid of it? Almost on a regular basis in scriptures, you find Jesus, the word of God, God saying, fear not. I told you three things. If you practice these three things, you will never experience COVID. You will not experience COVID. And I thank God for how God has kept us, kept us as a family, kept us as a, as, as a household, kept us as a church household. You will never, if you hear this word, if you receive this word, remember, inspiration, illumination, then what? Manifestation. So if you've not received the word, there may be a challenge in having manifestation. He said to them, why are you so fearful? And what are the three words? I'll remind us of that. Number one is this. Do not fear their fear. Don't be afraid of COVID. You have the greater one living inside of you. COVID-19 is not greater than the greater one. You have God living on your inside. Don't be afraid. Then why, is, why are people so afraid? Because many times they either do not have the greater one or they are not aware of the greater one. Don't fear their fear. Number two is this. Remember the promise of God. God is a covenant keeper, not a covenant breaker. He says, my covenant will I no war break. Neither will I alter the words which has gone forth out of my mouth. And what exactly is the word that he gave us? At the beginning of COVID-19, we took a vaccination. Amen. The world is still looking for vaccination. We took our own first vaccination in March and we've taken it at least two or three other times within that period. And I've given you instructions. Number one is this. Don't be afraid of their fear. Number two is this. Believe the word of God. Hold on to Psalm 91. That he that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will see say of the Lord. He is my refuge. He is my fortress and my work. My God, in him do I want 
trust. And because you will say, hallelujah, he says, surely. That means if you refuse to say, that may not be surely. But when you say it, then surely will be your experience. He says, surely I will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from every war, perilous pestilence. Hallelujah. And he will cover you with his feathers. Under his wing, you will take refuge. His truth will be your shield and buckler. When I go out, when I enter into a day, I just don't enter into the day. I enter into the eternal refuge of God. And in the eternal refuge of God, he said, he will cover me with his feathers. Under his wings, I will take refuge. His truth will be my shield and my buckler. Then verse number five, he said, I will not walk. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid of the terror of the night, or the arrows that flies by day, or the destruction that lies with at what? Noonday. Or the what? Pestilence that walks about in darkness. I will not be afraid of them. And that includes COVID-19. Declare this word over your life. Then seven says, a thousand will fall by my side. Ten thousand by my right side. They shall in no way come near me. Oh, oh, only with my eyes I will see the recompense of the wicked. Because I have made the Lord my God and the most are my habitation. Therefore no evil shall befall me. And no war, no plague, no sickness, no disease, no COVID-19 will come near me. Declare that over your life. Declare that over your dwelling. Declare that over yourself. I was talking at the apostolic training school this morning, and I was asking one of us about her mom who works in a facility, you know, in one of the facilities where, you, where they've had a lot of outbreaks of COVID-19. And I said, how often, how many times has she done the test now? She's done it 19 times, and all of them has actually returned negative result 19 times 19 not once not twice i think the last time she showed me she must have done i think nine and i saw it with my own eyes negative 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 the word of god is true and i'm standing on the word of god word of god is power I'm standing on the word of God. Word of God is power. I'm standing on the word of God. The word of God is power. I'm standing on the word of God. The word of God is power. Jesus didn't talk about the storm because they couldn't do anything about the storm. But he spoke to them about their fear because they could do something about what? their response to the storm. He said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You know what? They forgot the word he gave to them at the beginning. What did he say to them at the beginning? Let us cross over to the other side. He didn't tell them, let us go and perish within the what? Within the sea? Let us go and drown there? If he had said that, they would have had a call to say, Lord, Oh, we don't want to perish yet. But he said, let us cross over. The master had spoken. The Lord of the storm had spoken. The one that created the heavens and the earth had spoken. The one that created all the winds and the sea and the oceans have spoken. And I'm telling you, creation do not have a choice but to what? To respond and to respect the word of his creator. He spoke, let us go over to the other side. And that settles the matter. In spite of the storm, in spite of the issue, in spite of the problems. And likewise, the way he's spoken to us that we will emerge infinitely better at the end of it than what? When it all started. God is my witness. I've spoken to people outside of Melbourne who are constantly on this platform, both in North America and even in Africa, and they've been telling me that we've been experiencing this world. He said, Oh, you've declared it. We've been experiencing this world. We've been experiencing this world. The word that God has been giving to us. Don't just look and say, How can it be? You receive it. I said, This is the word. He said, How is it that you have no faith? Then, verse number 41 And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? 
the world that even the wind and the sea obey him. I love it in King James. What manner of man is this? That even what? The wind and the sea obey him. His spirit is living on your inside. His spirit is living on my inside. The one that created the heavens and the earth. The one that every stone will have to bow before. That's the one living. It's called the greater one. They say, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Are you ready for these dimensions of harvest? And I'll go to practical principles of harvest from next week. This morning I've laid the foundation preparing us for the harvest that God has started with some and will eventually bring into the lives of many. How to prepare us for this? To let us realize, number one, be ready inspiration the dimensions of revelation of god's word inspiration number two illumination number three manifestation and three dimensions of the kingdom i won't repeat it you go back to your notes get listen to it again and again and again and these ones are to prepare you for your testing because you're about to cross over to the other side so you come out at the other side far far what better infinitely better than when it all started. Then the harvest that it will produce in your life will be a blessing to many. And it's shooting out like branches that others will come, neighbors will come, friends will come, classmates will come and find succor and find comfort in it. That is our Lord. That is what God is calling us to as a church. And I want to pray for you. I want us to rise up all on your feet, wherever you are, as to pray together. And I want you to just thank him for the word you've heard today. Thank him for this word of life. Thank him for this word of power. Thank you for the word that has been released to us. Thank him, 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 thank him. And Pray that this word, ask the Lord that this word you've heard will produce fruit in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, pray that it will produce fruit in your life. If you do not know him, ask him to come into your heart to make you, to make him in your life your Lord and Savior. Invite him. Invite him so that the God of the earth can start to reign and rule in your life. Heavenly Father, I present everyone under the sound of my voice before you, Lord. And I'm asking that this war will walk in them to will and to do of your good pleasure. Father, I pray, O oh Lord my God, that let there be inspiration, let there be illumination so that there can be manifestation. Lord, I pray that no, none of them will be forgetful here, that everyone will go back and take this word and start to apply them in their lives. Father, we thank you. We worship and we adore you. Thank you for the day. I declare the rest of our day blessed. I declare, oh Lord, the rest of our week blessed. I say your week is blessed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I release this into your life. I hear again the word I gave to me yesterday. Oh, be expecting surprises. Be expecting surprises in the name of Jesus. Be expecting it. And the hand of God will go, gonna come upon you. Will come upon you and you will outrun every Ahab to the gates of Jezreel. It's called a new unction and a new anointing. Opening new doors for you in the name of Jesus Christ. You have not finished yet. You are just in the evening of your life. And even if you seem to be approaching nightfall, it is not over until it is over. You continue to bear fruit in your old age in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you and we give you all the praise. We worship and we adore you, Lord. Thank you once again for the word of life and the word of power. Oh Lord, in Jesus' name, we have prayed. 